Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. As always, I hope you had a great week. And remember that Let's Talk Micro, it's available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, Pandora, Good Pods. Whatever you listen to podcasts, you can find Let's Talk Micro. I am also on Instagram as Let's Talk Micro, no apostrophe, and on Twitter as Let's Talk Micro 1. So go ahead and subscribe. If you listen to an episode and you like it, go ahead and leave a review. I'm always looking also for any possible podcast topics. So any feedback, any suggestions, they are always appreciated. But go ahead and subscribe. And if you haven't listened to the latest episode of Let's Talk Micro, go ahead and do so. It is about Streptococcus pneumoniae. So this is a two-part episode. On the first one, I go over the morphology, the biochemicals, I start talking about testing, such as the bile solubility test. And then on the next episode, I go ahead and talk about a popular test that is used for streptococcus pneumoniae, an antigen test that is mainly used for urines. And then, you know, the package insert says that it's also used for, for cerebrospinal fluid. So I talked about that test. I talked about a little bit about molecular testing and how to correlate that to the gram stain. And then I also talk about streptococcus pseudonymoniae. So if you haven't heard about streptococcus pseudonymoniae before, tune into that episode. So it's a total of two episodes about streptococcus pneumoniae. And today's episode, it's a little bit longer than most episodes. So I'm just going to talk real quick about it and then we'll proceed to the interview. So it is an interview episode. Those of us that are educators that, you know, that teach we found ourselves in challenging times when the pandemic hit. All of a sudden, everyone had to go home. You had to stay remote. You have to transition to online learning. So how do we do that? How do we effectively teach those hands-on skills that you know we need in microbiology? How do we do that for the students? So this is an interview about a, a microbiology class at the University of California in Merced and how they adapted. What did they do? to make sure that students, even though they were on a remote learning setting, to make sure that they could get those hands-on skills that we need in microbiology. So it's very interesting. I hope that you, for the audience, you know, I hope that it helps. And for you educators out there, I hope that maybe this is something that you might want to implement at some point in time, or maybe, you know, you find it useful for the future. So I hope you enjoy it. So let's go ahead and listen to the interview. So today's episode is an interview episode. And we are here to talk about an article titled An Upper Division Remote Microbiology Laboratory that blends virtual and hands-on components to promote student success during the COVID-19 pandemic. As educators, those of us that teach microbiology or any subject, you know, we found it challenging when the pandemic hit. You know, how do we teach online? So this article talks about that. It was published in the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education of the American Society for Microbiology on June 6 of this year. So with me, I have Dr. Garcia Ojeda. Dr. Garcia Ojeda, welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Thank you, uh, Luis, for having me over. My pleasure. So for the audience, uh, let's go ahead and start with an introduction. So my name is Marcos Garcia Ojeda. I'm originally from Puerto Rico, and I am an associate teaching professor of biology in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California, Merced. We are the newest campus of the UC system. Um, I am trained as an immunologist and microbiologist, but currently I am a teaching professor. And the research that I conduct, it's research on biology education which is, therefore, I have the lab and the, um, the classroom is, my, is the lab that I have. So um, let's go ahead and I'll be asking questions about this article, but can you start with just an, a brief overview of it? Yes, please. So the article describes the adaptations that we implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic to deliver an upper division microbiology lab course. As you mentioned, the pandemic forced a lot of us to have to transition our classes to remote environments. And 
we wanted to figure out how to effectively teach a microbiology lab so the students had some level of hands-off experience when uh, they finished the class. Because we have a lot of students that will go either to um, research careers, and we were very concerned that they will go into an interview and be asked, oh, how, are you able, have you taken a microbiology lab? It's like, yes, online. And I never touch a micro. That will not make them very competitive um, in the um, job market. So we adapted the class uh, to have our students experience handling microorganisms safely from home and perform microbial techniques that will help them succeed in their future careers. So we created a class that is blended, meaning that it has online simulations as well as hands-on activities that allow the students to experience a really wide range set of activities that would happen normally in or lab class. So at the end, we evaluated how effective the online delivery of the class was and compared it to other instances where we have taught similar um, um, skills in person. And we found that there was a very little difference between the students' understanding and performance of this blended course to the times that we have the class delivered in person. Okay, yeah. Um, like I mentioned at the, at the intro, yes, that was something that when the pandemic hit, yeah, all of a sudden we have to transition online. So it's like, oh, it's like, what do we do? Some some instructors, maybe you don't have the the training, you have the, they haven't had experience teaching online courses, and then you have micro, which is something to so hands on that I got to see students that uh, learn online. You know, they're like, okay, I I saw a video on like how to gram stain, but I haven't perform one or I haven't touched a microscope yet. So definitely when I was reading this, I'm like, this looks, you know, very interesting because definitely as educators, we, we need to adapt. And this is something that we can potentially incorporate in the future as we move on. Okay. So well, one of the first things that instructors go over when we start a lab course, you know, it's always, and I remember this from my school days, you go into a lab and the first thing you do is lab safety. So the article says that students, they had to pass a course titled Lab Safety Fundamentals Without Hazmat. Can you talk more about this uh, class and what did it entail? So any student or any employee of the University of California that is going to be doing work in a research lab, ben wet bench lab, needs to be taking this class. And this class is a two and a half hour e-course that is provided by um, the um, university. Uh, I think it's part of one of those city trainings that everybody needs to take. So usually it's taken by employees, but as part of the class, we negotiated with the environmental health and safety people to extend that training to our students. Um, one of the programmatic learning outcomes of the department and the major is to ensure that the students understand laboratory safety. So now the students, as part of taking the microbiology lab, as well as I believe the immunology and the developmental lab, they're able to take this class like any employee that uh, will be going to work. And the class covers uh, topics on evaluating um, hazards, controlling exposure uh, to hazards, minimizing risks, as well as, as well as being vigilant in the lab. They also did a biosafety and lab safety simulations from Labster, which is what we um, uh, traditionally would have done in person in the class, but we used the laughter simulations to do that. So in combination, all three aspects help the students get a broad exposure of how to be safe in the lab, because we also wanted them to have that level of safety at home. Even though when they're working with microbes that are coming from food, those microbes may pose a risk to people who may be, for example, immunocompromised. So we wanted them to have the foundation so they kept their cultures safe as well as themselves and their loved ones safe. Okay. 
so as far as this class you know this on um, this hybrid so what are the components of this course okay so we kept the timing of the class just as if we were going to meet meeting in person so the students had to they had reserved time twice a week for three hours so in that time if they wanted to they could come and work with the teaching assistant and have the time to go over the material that they're doing at home. Also, the class had a one hour lecture where they met with me remotely via Zoom, and we evaluated and discussed what was going to happen in the following week. So that's why this class is a three unit course, because it has the two three hour lab sessions as well as this hour lab. Now the online class, um, a lot of the things that we would have done in person needed to be moved into the online environment. And for that, we use simulations. So we looked at the microbiology simulations from lab and we basically almost chose all of them that we could incorporate because they were mirroring a lot of the um, activities and topics that we were covering in the accompanying lecture. This, this, there's another class, which is the microbiology lecture that uh, is a four unit class. And we organize a lot of the simulations to coincide with some of the topics that we're covering in lab. So they reinforce one another. Simulations that we couldn't find on Labster or that we didn't really think that those were appropriate, we did with other uh, free simulations like BioInteractive, for example. So the, the hands-on component was actually fun because I was trying to figure out what kind of microbes can the students play with that is going to allow them to go through the process of isolating a microbe through a streak plate technique, performing a gram stain, and observing the microbe and evaluating its um, uh, characteristic in the microscope. So we did some research and found that some uh, ASM scientists are using kombucha which as you know, it's a fermented tea. And since it's something that they can buy in the supermarket and it is uh, full of probiotics, those probiotic microbes are, relati are considered relatively safe. So we provided the students with a microscope, a kid's microscope um, that has a little light source on it. And it had um, magnification all the way up to 1200 uh, fold. We provided them with um, 20 petri dishes and nutrient rich agar so they can melt it and pour it at home. Um, that came from a company and I forgot the name of the company but that, I can give that information for you and your uh, listeners later. As well as an inoculating loop and a gram stain kit that the company also provided, which came with all the reagents required to do gram stain. In total, the cost of that was about $104 per student. And we have between 40 to 16 students per session. Oh, the other part that is important with this is that, as you know, many classes have an unknown identification project where the students uh, are giving them bacterium and they have to go through um, biochemical, morphological, and uh, molecular tests to identify the ident uh, to get the identity of this microbe. So, um, Kansas Cole, she um, looked throughout all the years that we have been teaching the class together, and got images of all the tests that we are doing, and she put together eight different unknown portfolios, which had the lab results for eight different Pseudomonas species. So in that way, we can give a PDF uh, PowerPoint to the students with all this battery of tests and the students then were able to um, sit down and go through the process of using their logic and critical thinking skills to identify the microbe. Wow, I definitely like all this idea. So how you found a, you know, found a kit uh, you gave them media, and so they got to practice that hands-on. And sp speaking of which, so as far as, you know, you're planning and you're gram staining, 
Do you have an instructional line um, available for questions and doing perhaps like a demonstration while they were doing the task or did they watch a video and then they perform the task? How did, how did this work? So Luis, I did all these experiments at home from my kitchen and my dinner table. So I wanted to show, instead of being in the lab with all the safety precautions that we will do, I decided I have to do this the same way that the students are doing it. So I bought two cutting boards that I could uh, spray with uh, <laughs> disinfectant to my heart's content and put them in my diner table. And I perform all the techniques from that dinner table, my pets running around, my spouse moving in the kitchen and doing things. So I created a battery of videos for absolutely every single one of the techniques that they were going to be doing as if they were doing them from home because that's what the students were doing. So instead of doing them from the lab, which is a more um, safe, restricted environment, of course, we have the autoclave, we have big lab bench, we have pipettes and all those things. Let me do it the same way that the students are doing it from home. So I created the videos, I edited the videos, I put them online in our LMS system, which is Canvas. During the time, the TA had the three hours. So the students could be together with the TA and they will be able to then show, okay, look, this is my plate. This is the way that I'm streaking my bacteria. Am I doing this right? And the TA hopefully is able to give them uh, immediate feedback about what they are doing in that interaction. So the teaching assistant, Candace, was present twice a week for three hours. And of course, I was I had office hours for the students and they could reach my, my email, but I demonstrated all the techniques from home, hopefully using exactly the same materials that they were using from at their houses. So that was more or less how we tackled that difference of what the students show. So that's, I mean, I have bloopers because of them, because as you know, you're at home, you have pets, they want to be in your lab, things are happening that usually do not happen at home. And I purposely kept that because I could then use, for example, the videos to say, okay, there's a lot of peccadillos happening here in lab safety. Can you please identify them? And let's put that as an extra credit activity. And the students will then watch the video, let's say on the streaking, and then they will start to say, okay, at minute X, professor did this, which is not considered safe in the lab environment. Or a pet passed by and decided to try to land in their lab and all these kinds of things were happening so they will also bring awareness to them about that safety wow that's great um yeah i mean especially the since they're doing something that's a little bit different so it was really good that you actually did everything yourself the same way that way you know you got familiar with everything they were doing and you were prop you know able to demonstrate it properly in the videos and you know videos are good because you can watch them and then pause them and keep at your own pace but at the same time it's good that they had the 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 supplies so they can do the hands-on and with the bloopers i mean yeah sometimes you know we do keep lab safety but things do happen in the lab sometimes you know where we get distracted or we get you know instruments stop working and we get sometimes distractions so definitely so that was really good um so as far as examination so what how were they tested Good question, Luis. Um, I kept the same level of examinations and evaluations that I do in the class. So there were two exams. Um, and the exams, I decided purposely to keep a practical part to it. The first part of the exam will, I mean, the things that I would normal, normally will do in class, where I will have petri dishes with microorganisms, different media, so they can identify um, for example, blood agar plates where they could see if there is alpha hemolysis, beta hemolysis, or gamma hemolysis, all those things, instead of having plates that they could handle by hand, I use pictures. So um, ASM has a fantastic uh, database of pictures that it's available, I believe, for anybody who's a member of ASM. So it was really cool to be able to pour through um, 
those images find, for example, colonies that I can put in images and ask them, okay, describe this colony. What is the elevation? What is the colony shape? What is the edge of the colony? And all of that, all of the things that would have been done hands-on per se that they would have had to handle, I did them with the exams online. However, I wanted to test them on their ability to strike plate. That was the main um, hands-on technique that I wanted them to master because it is one of the most used techniques by any microbiologist. If you're able to get single colonies uh, from a mixed population, you can then perform experiments. The, be that a medical test to try to determine which organism is causing a disease in a patient, or if you're in the research lab where you're trying to isolate a clone, for example. So the students have to demonstrate that they could do the streak plate. And then they will take a picture of the streak plate and upload it into Canvas. And we will then give them uh, a grade based on the rubric that we created to evaluate their hands-on performance. We also make sure that other things, for example, um, we ask them to take pictures back and forth of the plates to see where they were labeling the plate. Um, are they having the label on the lid? Is the label on the plate itself? Are they including the important information like the date, their number of the, uh, the name of the species and all these other good things that a well um, labeled plate should have. And that was also part of the evaluation for that. Of course, we have little quizzes because we wanted to keep them um, around. They have the homework from the simulations from Labster, so that could be turned in, as well as homework from some of the experiments that we kept um, in class. Um, and lastly, we had the big identification of the unknown, where the students uh, will write I chose this time to do a lab report instead of a paper like I usually do, because it was going to be a little bit more challenging to teach them how to write a paper for publication online than to try to uh, just follow a more traditional lab report style. Um, that could be something to do in a different class online as well, but I was I could only do one thing, which was to try to get the class per se, but having the additional part of teaching how to write, especially with 60 students was going to be very challenging because trying to grade 60 research papers is for one TA and myself was going to be too much. So we did it as a lab report. And that will, con I think that, uh, that concluded all the assessment portions that will give them the grade. So I like the fact that you mentioned about the, you know, the evaluating the streaking techniques you know that's always as a student and even as tech sometimes or microbiology you know it's, sometimes it's challenging getting comfortable with the agar you might puncture it with your loop um making sure you do the proper technique and for labeling uh that's always something very important you know things like not doing it on the lid you know the lid falls off everyone that works in micro at some point in time you have dropped your stack of plates and if you label the lids that's it you're done so it's these are things that we need to know as, as you know as as students and as professionals. Also the dates uh, when we're doing susceptibilities, we always need a, a fresh organism, so we want to make sure that we are looking at the date. So these are very important concepts. And and to add to that, that you're saying, Luis, the fact that I did the experiments myself gave me an indication of exactly what the students were doing. For example, the nutrient agar. The manufacturer's instruction doesn't tell us how much agar there is in the solution. And me, with my good hands, I pierce it like I was just going through a knife through it. So I was already cognizant that if I am piercing the agar with my inoculating loop, the students are going to stab the heck out of these things as well. So I was able to modify this and tell them, you know what, you have to be extremely careful with this because it is very delicate. And also keep that in consideration when evaluating their performance, because if the, I mean, usually is not, it was not as hard as an agar as we will like when we do the lab place ourselves. So things like that helped the fact that I did the experiments with the same materials that they did, as opposed to like the pre 
homemade plates that we could have done ourselves in the lab just to show things, which probably had a higher percent of, let's say, of agar. Um, but yeah, um, that little thing is what I wanted to remind, uh, just remind me about it because you mentioned it. Yes, they are definitely important. You know, because then if you hadn't done it, then all of a sudden, let's see that you get all these pictures of puncture plates and you're like, what's going on? But so you need, you got familiar with the agar and, and it's all, you always need to keep a, a soft touch. And in that case, the agar was softer than, than usual. So that was, that was definitely good. So as far as this, this type of instruction, uh, what worked well, you know, what didn't, what challenges you had? So the students in majority love the simulations. They love the fact that they could do simulations. Labsters have put a lot of money into making some fantabulous simulations that are very interactive. And therefore, that, that was a big win. Um, our class was the only class that actually had a component the students could do at home, feels like it. Uh, because everybody else was just looking for simulations and um, they just didn't think about sending materials to the students. And first, with the stuff that we did, it was easy. Um, the students can get a kombucha from their store. The materials are coming from a resource that it is has already some safety standards attached to them. So that facilitated that happen. The portfolios that we were using for the unknown, I think that they were good about providing the students with the ability to evaluate um, data from biochemical analysis. But in a sense, they cannot substitute the actual hands-on process of doing the biochemical test themselves. When you're just giving the test tube with the color change, let's say, that may indicate oxidation or reduction of some compound, like or production of H2S, you can see the black precipitate, but going through the process to the makes the students more intimately familiar with what those biochemical tests are. So the portfolios help the students analyze the data and get information out of them, but oftentimes the students will still be unsure about, oh, what is this test really measuring? Why do I need to add um, iodine to the starch hydrolysis agar and seeing the development of it? So when you see that it goes from completely clear, you add your iodine, now you have these beautiful areas of clearing the, around your streak, you begin to realize, oh, it's because the bacteria are secreting enzymes that are digesting the starch around them. So things of that nature, I believe, were slightly lost by the use of the pictures, as opposed to the students doing it by hand. So that is one of the things that I think work in the, from the point of view of making them think about identifying an organism, but it didn't work from the perspective of having a deeper, intimate understanding of what the biochemical tests were. Yeah, you definitely said it, you know, that the the hands-on component, I mean, there's something that's just very, very important. I mean, even with, you get some, you know, some hand memory and it just, it helps you. Like for me, I can watch a video on how to do something and, but it's not until I actually do the test that I fully grasp the concept of what everything is. You know, you put it together with the hands-on and, and the knowledge. So it's very, it's very important. I mean, I, even though, yeah, we can go to an extent learning something by, you know, watching and reading and, but it's definitely a very important component of microbiology. And so at least, you know, they got to do a portion of it in, in those challenging times. And the other challenging thing was try to repeat things. Um, the students had a limited number of plates, for example, they only got 20. It's not like we have a kitchen where they can be produced. Oh, I need another YTA plate. Please give me another one because I messed it up. You got 20 plates. You need to pour them yourself. And you're pouring them in less than ideal conditions. You do not have a flow hood where you're pouring them and there's not going to be any contamination on them. So some students 
were able to do their pouring and they may have zero to very low contamination. Other students, because for whatever reason, they may be in a more dirty environment, it was fire happening at the same time, whatever it was, their air was not as clean. And therefore, more particular, were able to fall when they're pouring their plates. So all of a sudden, six out of the 20 plates are full of contamination and not being able to be used. So things of that nature put a limit to what the student can do. And the other thing that we had a little bit challenged is that um, our students, few of them are locals. A lot of them live anywhere in the state, some of them out of state. So sending the materials to them by mail um, and having the material arrive to the student was sometimes challenging. Oftentimes students, you know, we use the addresses that are found in the registrar and that address was placed there when the students started as a freshman. They may have moved and they're living in a different apartment. They may have moved their partner. They may have moved with a family member to help them. So the packet was sent to that address, most likely mom and dad's address, and all of a sudden the student is in a different city. Uh, professor, I'm not getting my materials. They got at home, it's like, where's home? LA, where are you? Sacramento, uh, that is a humongous distance. So can you send me another one? It's like, uh, not really. <laughs> you can't, the, the dean is not gonna give me more money to send you a brand new set of kits for everything. So. You have to get somehow to get that material. So then the student have to drive, get their parents to mail them. So that communication, we try to solve a little bit of it in the second iteration of the class because we were thinking, so, oh, the students updated their information online. So we're going to use that. Mm -mm. That unfortunately was not the case. So we had about three or four students who did not get materials uh, immediately before the class began. So um, that also posed a challenge. Well, yeah, I'm definitely one that was, I guess, unforeseen because typically we don't think about that. I mean, if you go in person, you know, you get to your classes, you go in there and you don't, you know, keep track of where the student lives. So that was something that all of a sudden had to be taken into consideration when you were sending the materials. Wow. Okay, and I know you mentioned this when you were talking about the overview, but so can you once again for the audience? So what was the overall performance of the, you know, comparing in-person instruction versus this hybrid class? Excellent question, Luis. And in reality, we didn't see a lot of changes in overall performance. When I look, for example, at the class scores for those classes that were online, um, the great majority of the students passed the class. Only three students didn't pass the class compared to other semesters where maybe one or, or another student does. So that was very similar. And usually, um, because the fact that the students are doing um, semi-guided research project in the real lab. So the students are always very engaged and they put a lot of effort into doing well in the lab. So the semester that gave us the more challenge was the fall 2020 semester. Um, that's the one where instead of having scores around the 90s, we're having scores about 85. Um, as the medium score of the class, something of that nature. And the distribution of the grades was a little bit more broad than the distribution in other classes. But um, the great majority of the students still pass. It was that they didn't pass as stellarly as they have done in other times. That seemed to have been somewhat corrected in the spring 2021. Um, that the performance in that semester didn't really look any different than the performance in the other classes when we have them uh, in person, per se. We asked the question about um, how much of the lab safety they learn, and we evaluated the response, for example, of the lab safety questions that the students had in the online exam versus the in-person delivery, 
and there was really no difference. So it seems like the lobster simulation as well as the hazmat, uh, as the biosafety class, excuse me, uh, that the students take were equally well at preparing the students to be able to identify lab safety hazards and answer questions that related to life safety. We had another assignment that was that we kept, which because it was um, it was an in silico experiment to begin with in class. It was the idea about calculating um, dilutions and and being able to calculate and do the mathematics of how many cells are in a culture, how many cells, how many generations are happening. And again, it was the fall 2020, which had a slightly lower performance than the other classes that we observe. Um, not really the spring per se, but it seems my hypothesis goes that there has been something really challenging in that particular fall 2020 semester for the students that was going to be the first time where they were completely going to be online. Professors were still trying to figure out what the heck we were doing with online delivery. Um, our students have all kinds of challenges that may and distractors that may have impacted their performance. In particular, in California, we were having two things that were very challenging for the students that semester was the wildfires. We had a particularly challenging wildfire season. And I count, I forgot how many students I had that were being evacuated from their home because their, I mean, their families, they were living with their family, but they were living on mountainous areas. And all of a sudden it's like, we have to be evacuated. And I will not going to be able to have internet and I do not know where I'm going to be or if I'm going to have a house when we come back. So that tended to have actually just happened to us just this summer as well with the Mariposta fires uh, and faculty <laughs> who live in the mountains. Um, so that was one thing. And the other challenge that I was thinking was the political situation of the US. My students, at our university are predominantly Latinos. And when we had a political climate that was vilifying Latinos and um, we have a large number of students who are DACA students and they didn't feel safe to be able to be at schools and we're having to wonder if the political climate was going to allow them to continue in school. All those factors would have allow them, in my opinion, to have um, reduce um, the reduced cognitive uh, capacity to be able to deal with their coursework as well as everything that they're doing. So we figure that at the end, since the semester happened, faculty got better at delivering the class online, the students got better at taking classes online, and the spring came out after the holiday season and there were no fires anymore and really not much political things that that may have helped a little bit. But it's things that as a biology education researcher, I would like to study and investigate how those other factors they have in, influence our students in their performance. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and those were some times that we were not used to as far as, you know, like we found ourselves being at home all the time. Uh, maybe some people were not able to work or um, so some families, they lost incomes. So there was a lot of things, you know, going around that definitely maybe our, our we have not, might, not, might have not been on the, on the best, you know, state of mind. So that maybe could have contributed to it. I know that when I came back to teach on the fall of 2020, yeah, definitely the mood was very different. It was just, you know, it wasn't as, you know, the, it was lively before the pandemic hit and then it was just a little gloomy. Everyone with the mask on, reduced number of students, only like, you know, an X amount at a time. So yeah, there are definitely many, many factors contributed um, to that. You know, Luis, um, my students in... Since I was co-teaching the lecture and the lab, the students in the lecture, um, most of them had their camera on 
which was really, uh, actually, sorry, most of them, a good number had the camera off, but a good number also had their camera on. And I saw students taking my class from their laundry room. I saw my students taking the class with a little sibling next to them because they were taking care of them, making sure that the little sibling was doing their homework. Um, I had students who were in their cars parked next to a McDonald's because McDonald's has free Wi-Fi and they could steal it from, or quote unquote, steal it from the McDonald's. So the conditions were not ideal for my students. My students are, most of them are first generation. About 70% of my students are first generation. They are the children of first responders and frontline workers. They have very little privilege. And therefore, they had, I mean, the pandemic time was challenging for all of us, but I will put my hand on fire to say that my students had a particularly challenging time because of all these other factors that they were experiencing. These were not the children of people who say, oh, yes, we can have perfect Wi-Fi at home. And you will have a student area where you can sit down and work in your desk and work. It's like, no. Oftentimes, they will, will tell me, it's like, we have only one computer, and my sister also needs to use it for her class. Just like, there you go. So just do the best that you can. And we became flexible into how we work with them to ensure that we didn't put more stressors and challenges on them by the way that we wanted to do things. Yes, yeah. And I, I definitely commend them because, you know, it's looking back at when I was in school and for me, you know, it was learning all this stuff and, you know, adapting to all these changes, you know, definitely, you know, I'm going to shout out to them for getting through that and pushing through and, and continuing their education. So is, is this type of instruction currently being implemented or are you going to implement it in the future? That's an excellent question. And right now, since the classes are in person, we're not doing this at all. Um, we have begun to implement what is called the Small World Initiative, which it's a course based undergraduate research experience that is happening in the class where the students are working to discover new antibiotic producing bacteria. So that's how the class is currently set. set. That said, I think that we have laid down the foundation to be able to have an online course that students could take from home and be able to uh, demonstrate proficiency in a lot of the course learning outcomes that we have for the class. The challenge is, is the cost, especially because you have to pay for the lecture simulations and you have to pay for the materials. I mean, the course materials for the students were about 80 something dollars, $85, I believe. Um, but during the pandemic, we were not charging the students that um, to not make their life more challenging. Um, but I think that the lab as we currently have it could be modified by, by any professor who wants to teach, let's say, take some of those experiments and move them to freshman students so they can start doing something before they come to college. Take it and move around them as a community college kind of class, for example, if they want to be online. or have it similarly to what the UC San Diego is having, which is an extension class where students will then uh, are be able to perform them. I know that the extension class from UC San Diego is expensive because they're, the students are paying close to four hundred, close to four hundred dollars, three hundred and something dollars in lab materials alone. So they get this ginormous kit um, that they need to do. Um, and it seems to be a very well, beautifully organized class. But I th one of the things that we like about our, the way that we did things is the it costs a fraction of that. So it makes it more affordable for us and it makes it more affordable for the students. Yeah, definitely. Uh, less expensive. Um, so is there anything else that you want to add or mention about this article? Or Well, absolutely. Um, the first thing is that 
none of this would have been possible without the support of the lab staff that were dedicated to help us get the kits to the students. Uh, and that's Dr. James Whalen and his people. Um, and also that I am blessed to have a fantastic dean who uh, supported it and absorbed the cost of sending the materials for the students because it was free to them. Um, so they didn't have to pay that 105 bucks. Um, and she believed that what we proposed was going to be beneficial. And she said, go ahead, Marcos, I'll help you and we're going to cover that. Um, and it came out of the goodness of her heart. So I was just like, whoa, this is fantastic. So any class like this needs to have institutional support. And that's things that it's not only the professor and the teaching assistant, but also the lab staff who need to order the things, pack them, send them to them, uh, um, organize the simulations with the company so we can have access to them. And uh, all those things need to be taken into consideration, like getting the addresses, that making sure that once we get the address that we email the students, is this address the good one for us to send you something before we put the package in the mail? There's a lot of um, background support that needs to happen because as a professor, I do not have time to do any of that. So we, without that small village of people here, I don't think, um, I would have been able to successfully deliver the class. On top of that, having a fantastic teaching assistant, uh, she's now Dr. Candace Guzman Cole, and she is he she left us to go to the CDC to do research on antibiotic resistance. So I'm super sad to have seen her go, but I'm super happy that she is pursuing her dream as a postdoc now over there. Um, but the fact that she was invested in teaching and being the best instructor that she could because she has on her future uh, goals, not only being a scientist performing research, but also being an excellent teacher and professor helped immensely. Um, so having that level of commitment from my TA that they really wanted to learn about pedagogy and do everything in their power to deliver a quality class for the students was just fantastic as well. So you did all these little stars aligned that allowed us to be able to um, be successful with this. Well, that's amazing. You know, it sounds like you have a great team over there, and you know, and it's always great to you know to meet and and hear about either you know educators, microbiologists, or people that are trying just to make things better. Especially, you know, as educators, we want to make sure that our students either learn and they, you know, they grasp the concepts, they get a great experience. And it sounds like everyone over there at uh, UC Merced, you know, in microbiology, they did just that. So thank you so much. Okay, well, uh, you know, Dr. Garcia Ojeda, you know, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to come in over Let's Talk Biker and, and talking about this. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Luis, for having me over. It was my pleasure. And um, if you or any of um, members of your audience have a question, they can feel free to email me, I believe. Uh, please feel free to put my, my email address either on your website, it's also on the paper. Uh, and I'll be happy to talk to them in and help in whichever way I can. Okay, would you like to uh, tell it to the audience? Yeah, uh, my email is a bit complicated. It's my last names, M Garcia hyphen Ojeda at ucmerced.edu. So that's M G A R C I A hyphen O J E D A at ucmerced.edu. Okay, definitely. And I will I will go ahead and put it on the show notes. And when I and then make sure that the audience, if they have any questions, they reach out to you. Fantastic. Okay, so thing. Thank you again. Thank you, Luis. Pleasure being here. And that, my dear audience, is the end of this episode. I hope you enjoy listening to this interview with Dr. Marcos Garcia Ojeda. 
I hope you find it helpful. We all had to adapt to those times and and try our best to make sure that students, you know, got the content they needed, got what they needed from class. So I hope you can find this useful. Um, if you're an educator out there and, and you implement some sort of system like this, feel free, you know, and you want to be on the podcast, let me know. Email me at lestalkmicro at outlook.com and let me know and we can do an episode about it. I want to share this information with everyone. I find it so helpful. So as always, before that, continue bringing that passion to what you do. It is always so important. So stay motivated, stay safe, and of course, continue talking micro. Until the next time. Bye.